Hello there, very good evening and welcome to the news tonight, your one stop for the day's top stories from India and across the world. I'm Tracy Shilshi and in the next 30 minutes I'll be getting you all that, but first, the headlines. Prime Minister Narendra Modi holds bilateral talks with the visiting Sri Lankan Prime Minister. Ranil Vikrama Singhe backs the Indian Army's surgical strikes in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Cabinet Committee on Security reviews security situation after the surgical strikes. The Prime Minister advises ministers to avoid speaking out of turn on the issue. A trio of European scientists will share the 2016 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, awarded for finding ways to energize and steer molecules, which may lead to the development of new materials and tiny sensors. And tensions escalate in Syria. Russia sends advanced missile system to the port of Tartus, while U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says efforts to end the war will continue. First, Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, who is on a three-day visit to India, met Prime Minister Narendra Modi today. The two leaders discussed a, hold, a host, in fact, of bilateral issues, with cross-border terrorism figuring prominently in the talks. The Lankan Prime Minister lauded India's efforts to curb terrorism, referring to the surgical strikes carried out by the Indian Army to destroy terror launch pads in POK. He also called on SARC countries to come together against terrorism. Prime Minister Narendra Modi held bilateral talks with his Sri Lankan counterpart Ranil Vikramasinghe on Wednesday. While the closed-door talks touched on a number of issues of mutual and regional concern, the focus remained on cross-border terrorism. The Lankan Prime Minister said all SARC nations must come together to end this menace. What I've discussed with your government has been how does SARC evolve from here? What do we do there? Then uh, how do we ensure, as I, I commended the Prime Minister and the government for the restraint is shown in handling the issue. Then let us see how, what else we can do. That's, that, that's I would say is, let us look at getting things back so that there will be no cross-border terrorism in India or any other country. I know it compliments Prime Minister Modi for the approach that he has taken. Speaking to the media post the meeting, the Lankan Prime Minister asserted that the alliance between India and Sri Lanka is more robust than between any other country in the region. There are a lot of interesting projects we are doing with India. I came and discussed it. We are developing... Uh, Part of the highway system, we are looking at uh, cooperation in some of the security fields. We are work, we are with the Singaporean Subana Jorong is developing uh, Trincomalee, so India is also coming into it. Our relationship with China is the economic relationship. It's not a military one, and it's a part of the. By the time we took power, there the Chinese had already uh, given the loans for the building of the Ambantota Harbour and the. Airport. Earlier in the day, Ranil Vikramasinghe also met External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj and Home Minister Rajnath Singh. He also called on Congress President Sonia Gandhi and former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Sri Lankan Prime Minister has clearly said that the future of South Asia is closely related to India's prosperity. And so, cross-border terrorism must be in the agenda of SARC. Akhilesh Suman for Raj Sabha Television with camera person Shiv Kumar in Delhi. And the Sri Lankan PM's support to India comes close on the heels of Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Sien Lung, who is also backing India on the issue of terrorism. Lung is in India on a five-day visit and had agreed to strengthen cooperation in countering terrorism. Today, of course, he called on President Pranam Mukherjee at the Rashtrapati Bhavan, where the two held talks on wide-ranging issues. A delegation of ministers and members of parliament accompanying the Singaporean Prime Minister were also present there. On Tuesday, Lee had held uh, summit-level talks with Prime Minister Narendra Modi during which the two countries signed three agreements. And on Thursday, the Prime Minister will attend the launch of the Centre of Excellence for Tourism Training in Udaipur. The centre has been built as part of skill development collaboration under the India-Singapore Strategic Partnership signed in November 2015. Now, the Cabinet Committee on Security met on Wednesday to discuss the security scenario in the wake of the surgical strikes. 
and Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who chaired the meeting, is understood to have advised his ministers to avoid chest thumping on the issue. Incidents of ceasefire violation by Pakistan in the past few days, the Prime Minister has once again reviewed the security situation along the line of control and the international border. At a meeting of the Cabinet Committee on Security on Wednesday, Home Minister Rajnath Singh gave a brief on the situation along the border and in Jammu and Kashmir. Defence Minister Manohar Parikar, External Affairs Minister Sushma Suraj and the chiefs of three forces were also present in the meeting. Later, the cabinet also approved amendments to the HIV and AIDS Prevention and Control Bill 2014, which seeks to safeguard rights of HIV-affected people to prevent and control spread of HIV and AIDS. Vishal Dahiya, Rajasabha TV, Delhi. The BSF on Wednesday took into custody nine Pakistani fishermen after their boat entered Sirkir area in Gujarat. The BSF patrol noticed a wooden fishing boat which had ventured into the Indian waters. The nine Pakistani nationals are being questioned, even as sources say nothing objectionable has been recovered from them. Now, the seizure comes at a time when there is heightened security between uh, tension, in fact, between India and Pakistan. The BSF had seized an empty boat belonging to the Pakistan Rangers on Tuesday as well after it drifted from across the border into Punjab. Another Pakistani boat with nine crew members was apprehended off the Gujarat coast by the Indian Coast Guard on the 2nd of October. The UN's highest court on Wednesday threw out a case brought by the tiny Marshall Islands against India for allegedly failing to halt the nuclear arms race. The 16-judge bench at the International Court of Justice will rule later whether the Pacific Island nation's battle could continue against Pakistan and Britain. The archipelago is seeking to shine a fresh spotlight on the global threat of nuclear weapons, but the court found it lacked the jurisdiction in the case as there had been no prior recorded dispute or negotiations over the nuclear issue between the Marshall Islands and India. The tiny Pacific Island nation witnessed a string of nuclear tests on its uh, atolls between 1946 to 1958. These tests were carried out by the United States as the Cold War arms race gathered momentum. In other news, outlining the goals in ending extreme poverty by 2030, World Bank President Jim Yong Kim highlighted some of the huge challenges for developing countries like India. Ironically, these stem from the use of technology and automation, which he says can fundamentally disrupt the pattern of traditional economic path. He said this on the eve of the annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF. At a time when the world economy is grappling with an era of low growth, the World Bank president has a cautionary take on the effects of technology and automation on jobs and incomes in countries like India and China. Research based on World Bank data has predicted that the proportion of jobs threatened in India uh, by automation is 69%, in China, 77%, and in Ethiopia, the percentage of jobs threatened by automation is 85%. World Bank President Jim Yong King feels that the facts call for a deep review of the methodologies that are needed to fight poverty in developing countries. Now, as we continue to encourage more investment in infrastructure to promote growth, we also have to think about uh, the kinds of infrastructure that countries will need in the economy of the future. You know, we all know that technology has and will continue to fundamentally reshape the world. But the traditional economic path from increasing productivity uh, of agriculture to light manufacturing and then to full-scale industrialization may not be possible for all developing countries. The World Bank president also feels that issues like child stunting and malnutrition have made India's workforce extremely vulnerable and leave it incapable of competing globally. I, I strongly believe that we have to dramatically increase our aspirations both for the quantity and quality of investments in health, education and skills. If we don't, and if we don't do it quickly, not only is it a recipe for poor economic growth, but we'll leave a large population of people living in countries where the traditional low-skilled jobs are not available and who, often through no fault of their own, simply can't compete. Mechanization and technology have disrupted traditional industrial production in many countries. The World Bank president feels the way to achieve higher rates of inclusive and sustainable growth is not through isolationism and protectionism, but rather the solutions call for more cooperation, greater economic integration and stronger partnerships than ever before. 
ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट राज्यसभा टीवी from economy to climate in 3 days after india became the 61st nation to ratify the paris climate change agreement anil madhav dave the union minister for forest and environment credited prime minister modi and us president barack obama for the successful ratification in an exclusive interview to rs tv's neelu thomas on our show to the point dave said that the paris deal has shot up india's credibility at the global level now that india has submitted its uh, instrument of ratification to the un how does it really give india the leverage at the global forums at the global level credibility of the country will go high by doing this thing whom do you give credit to obama to modi ji or to your team the entire team which has helped you ratify the deal of particularly two p one prime minister and one president they played so nicely that now world is winning the battle and i'll take you through some more national news updates in nationwide heavy police force was deployed at uttar pradesh's bisada village after 22 year old accused in the dadri lynching case died in a delhi hospital due to dengue or perhaps chikungunya police said that the accused ravi alias robin was in judicial custody and hospitalized 2 days ago after he complained of pain His family members alleged foul play saying that he was beaten up in jail. Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi today said that farm loans will be waived off and par tariff will be reduced to half if the Congress comes to power in the UP Assembly polls next year. He was speaking to farmers in Maniharan in Rampur during the Kisan Yatra. Rahul also accused Prime Minister Narendra Modi of not fulfilling promises made by his government. The Madras High Court today said that RSS members cannot march in half pants across the state to celebrate Vijay Dashmi next month. The High Court said that they will have to wear full trousers. According to reports, about 200 to 300 RSS workers will march in each of these processions next month. ISRO today postponed the launch of India's latest communication satellite GSAT-18 due to heavy crosswinds. It was slated to take off in the wee hours tomorrow on board Ariane space rocket from Kourou in French Guiana. The launch in fact has been scheduled now. It was supposed to take off today but it's scheduled between 2 and 3:15 a.m. tomorrow. The Delhi High Court dismissed petitions of some private companies challenging the decision of the Ministry of Coal to club all sectors barring power under a single category for coal block auctions. The decision comes after almost 18 months when it was reserved in April 2015 on the pleas of four companies. Time for a quick break but up next international news. Now that India has submitted its uh, instrument of ratification to the UN, how does it really give India the leverage at the global forums? At the global level, credibility of the country will go high by doing this thing. Whom do you give credit to Obama, to Modi ji, or to your team, the entire team which has helped you ratify the deal? Particularly two P, one prime minister and one president. They played so nicely. that now world is winning the battle watch to the point with union environment minister anil madhav dave only on rajya sabha television from cories to metal pieces indian currency has seen many changes The earliest punch marked coins came from Gandhar. The East India Company at the turn of the 19th century also minted its own coins. The Indo-Greek coins come from a colony left behind by Alexander. They depict the golden rule of the Guptas with embossed human portraits and matrimonial alliances. like Chandragupta Maurya's wedding with Seleucus I Nicator's daughter
Welcome back. International News Now and three makers of the world's smallest machines have been awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for 2016. The Nobel has been awarded to Jean-Pierre Sauvage, Sergei Frazier Stoddart and Bernard L. Feringa for developing the molecular machine. Announcing the prize in Stockholm, a statement from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences said, and I quote, the development of computing demonstrates how the miniaturization of technology can lead to a revolution. The 2016 Nobel laureates in chemistry have miniaturized machines and taken chemistry to a new dimension, unquote. The Academy said that molecular machines will most likely be used in the development of things such as new materials, sensors and energy storage systems. The three scientists will equally share the price of 8 million Swedish krona, close to $1 million. This morning you ground your coffee. Maybe you used a motorized vehicle to get here. You used man-made machines operating on the centimeter to meter length scale. It's been the dream of scientists for over half a century to take this development all the way down to the molecular scale. That's nanometers. A nanometer is one million times smaller than a millimeter. In here, we have some molecular machines, a molecular motor, a molecular muscle, a molecular memory, an elevator, and there's a molecular car. This amazing development is due to several ingenious chemical innovations. Now, two days after the U.S. suspended talks of the Syrian ceasefire with Russia, Moscow has intensified its involvement on the ground. Russia has deployed its surface-to-air missile defense system in Syria as it joined the Syrian forces in fighting their way into rebel-held Aleppo. <laughs> Syrian government tanks crossed the front line in the battleground city of Aleppo for the first time in four years as a Russian-backed offensive to retake the rebel-held east escalated on the ground. The intensified attack comes just two days after the U.S. suspended talks with Russia on the ceasefire. Analysts believe the suspension of talks will further complicate matters. فجميع الأطراف المنخرطة هي تعمل على تحسين وضعها الميداني والعسكري وخصوصا فيما نشهده بمعركة حلب وما يتعلق بها كما أن جميع الأطراف تنتظر العودة لطاولة المفاوضات بقدوم الإدارة الأمريكية الجديدة التي ربما the situation in Syria has escalated rapidly since the suspension of talks. Russia has deployed its advanced S-300 VM surface-to-air missile system to Syria. Syrian and Russian airplanes continue their airstrikes on rebels, making a peaceful solution all that more difficult. We will continue, as we have before, to pursue a meaningful, sustainable, and forcible cessation of hostilities throughout the country and that includes the grounding of Syrian and Russian combat aircraft in designated areas. And Russia knows exactly what it needs to do in order to get that cessation implemented in a fair and reasonable way. The U.S. and other Western countries say Moscow and Damascus are guilty of war crimes for deliberately targeting civilians, hospitals and aid deliveries, a charge vehemently denied by the Syrian and Russian governments who say they target only terrorists. Bureau Report, Raja Sabha TV. Now to the U.S. in just 34 days before America goes to elections, the country witnessed its first and only vice presidential debate of 2016. The debate pitted Hillary Clinton's running mate, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia, against Donald Trump's running mate, Governor Mike Pence of Indiana. In a 90-minute long debate, both the vice presidential hopefuls launched attacks on presidential nominees Trump and Clinton. The debate was held at Longwood University in Virginia. In the first U.S. vice presidential debate, Democratic Senator Tim Kaine and his rival Republican Governor Mike Pence faced off on Tuesday night. The candidates clashed on a range of topics including national security and immigration. Their sharpest exchanges, however, centered on Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. The 90-minute debate saw the low-key Kaine go on the attack from the start.
This campaign in 2014, he said, if I run for president, I will absolutely release my taxes. He's broken and his he first will. He's broken his first promise. Second, he stood on he the hasn't stage broken last week. He, he, he stood on the stage last week, and when Hillary said you haven't been paying taxes, he said, that makes me smart. So it's smart not to pay for our military. It's smart not to pay for veterans. It's smart not to pay for teachers. And I guess all of us who do pay for those things, I guess we're stupid. Pence, the governor of Indiana, responded that Trump used the tax code just the way it is supposed to be used. Trump has filed over 100 pages of financial disclosure, which is what the law requires. But he said he and would release American his tax returns. The American people can review that, and he's going, Senator, All right, he's going to release his I need tax to ask returns you about when the audit social security. is over. Rich, the Richard the Nixon released about, tax returns when he was under audit. They're raise your tax Gentlemen, if, if you can't meet... 58-year-old Senator Kane also criticized Trump's complimentary remarks about Russian President Vladimir Putin. On Russia. So let's start with not praising Vladimir Putin as a great leader. Donald Trump and Mike Pence have said he's a great leader. And Donald Trump has, no, bus we has, business, dealings, has business dealings with Russia that he refuses to disclose. Hillary Clinton has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia as Secretary of State to do the New START agreement to reduce Russia's nuclear stockpile. She's had the experience doing it. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia and lodged protests when they went into Georgia. And we've done the same thing about Ukraine, but more than lodging protests, we've put punishing economic sanctions on Russia. Pence, however, contended that Putin will respect Trump because of his strength. In, in the wake of Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State, where she was the architect of the Obama administration's foreign policy, we see entire portions of the world, particularly the wider Middle East, literally spinning out of control. I mean, the situation we're watching hour by hour in Syria today is, is a result of the failed foreign policy and the weak foreign policy that Hillary Clinton helped lead in this administration and create. The vice presidential debate saw Pence coming on top with a narrow win, with 48 percent voters saying he did a better job than Tim Kaine. Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump and his Democratic rival Hillary Clinton will have their second debate on Sunday. Bureau Report, Raja Sabha TV. And now let's take through some more international news updates in Global Buzz. Storm and heavy rain warnings were issued on Wednesday as the powerful typhoon Chaba inched towards Japan. The typhoon lashed the southern coast of South Korea with winds that triggered flash floods and left at least two dead. The storm is set to hit Japan's main island of Honshu on Wednesday evening before moving out into the Pacific on Thursday. All Nippon Airways and Japan Airlines reportedly cancelled a combined 108 domestic flights. Hurricane Matthew pummeled Haiti and moved on to Cuba after killing seven people, unleashing floods and forcing hundreds of thousands to flee the Caribbean's worst storm in nearly a decade. The full scope of the damage, both human and material, remain unclear. Meanwhile, the first evacuations were ordered in the U.S. as coastal dwellers prepare to flee the approaching storm that is expected off the East Coast later this week. Afghan forces battled the Taliban in the northern city of Kunduz for the third straight day on Wednesday. The U.S. military provided air support to troops on the ground after insurgents launched an attack on the city last week. Since pushing into Kunduz on Monday and briefly hoisting their flag at a main intersection, the Taliban were pushed back, but their fighters are now hiding in residential homes, slowing the counter-offensive by the Afghans. Iraqi Prime Minister Heather al-Abadi on Tuesday said that he has repeatedly told Turkey not to intervene in its internal affairs and that he fears the Turkish adventure could turn into a regional war. The statement comes after Ankara decided to extend military operations against terrorist organizations in Iraq and Syria for another year. Meanwhile, Turkey said that it sent troops to northern Iraq as a part of an international effort to train and equip Iraqi soldiers fighting the Islamic State. And with that, let's change tracks, get you all the leaders from the world of sports in Sportsbeat. 
After signing a one-year deal, Ishan Pandita from Bengaluru became the first Indian player to get a professional contract from a La Liga club in Legans in Spain. He was handed the number 50 jersey by club vice president and owner Felipe Moreno. Pandita will start by playing for the junior side Legans B. Legans City is located on the outskirts of Madrid and is currently placed 11th in the league table. Maria Sharapova has claimed the doping panel at her original hearing was biased and wanted to make an example of her. Her two-year doping ban was reduced to 15 months on Tuesday after her appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. The five-time Grand Slam winner was initially banned by the International Tennis Federation for two years after testing positive for meldonium at the 2016 Australian Open. She will now be able to return to tennis courts on the 26th of April 2017. FIFA has banned Chile and five other countries after their supporters were found guilty of homophobic chanting. Earlier this year, Chile were handed a two-match ban with one suspended for the same offence. However, with this ban, Chile would have to find a new venue for their World Cup qualifying match against Venezuela. FIFA approved Chile's suspended sentence following their World Cup qualifier against Bolivia in September. And that's all we have for you on the news tonight from the entire team here. Good night.